Hello, my fellow mods, and welcome to The Perspecta. I'm your host, John O'Neill, and in association with DC Hillier and MCM Daily, welcome to our first in-person interview filmed on location at the Sheets Goldstein Residence in Los Angeles, California. Genuinely, I still can't believe this happened. I was in LA for a friend's wedding and somehow reached out to the right connections through Instagram to set up this opportunity. The residence has two associated surnames, Sheets for the original owner who commissioned the house and Goldstein for the subject of our interview. The man who truly perfected this house, working with original architect John Lautner for over two decades, James Goldstein. If you've recently seen Adam Sandler's movie Hustle or ever watched the NBA, you may recognize James as a courtside superfan and insider. He is always sporting pieces from his luxurious fashion collection, many of which he's helped to design. Once I realized that this style icon also owned one of the most famous mid-century modern houses, I just had to speak with him on the Perspecta. This conversation and tour was full of insight around design process, James's early influences, global architecture, and much more. James was extremely generous with his time, and it is clear that he and the manager of the residence, Roberta, do their best to make it accessible to true fans and students of design, a most admirable disposition. Relax to the soothing sounds of the home's water feature and enjoy the courtside view of this Beverly Hills conversation. James, thank you for having me here. Really appreciate it. It's obvious, I think, to many people that you're a fan of basketball, but I think what people don't know as much is that you're a big fan of modernist architecture. Very definitely. Would you say this is one of your biggest passions? My business card says fashion, architecture, basketball. Those are three, three really incredible things to focus on. For me, this is a masterpiece. And this is the, the Sheets Goldstein house. James has been, you know, able to have us here do an interview. And it was architected by John Lautner. And I was curious, you had a long relationship with John. What, what have you learned from him about architecture? I have learned how to properly design the details of a house, to put it briefly. Yeah. We worked together for 15 years. So I saw the way he approached each project from planning, I'm sure a lot of planning, mm -hmm. materials, I'm sure it was a big choice. Why, why do you think he used so much concrete? I think that he was aware, just as many other great architects are aware, that concrete is a beautiful material to use and it's not only beautiful, but provides opportunities to cantilever, for example. And that takes an underlying structure, right? Is there steel beams or other beams in the concrete? And then you, you pour around it? Is that how that works? Yes, there is metal that goes inside the provides the strength. Wow. I've heard other people talk about his architecture in Malibu and in other places. Um, I've heard people say that they're going to last 500 years or a thousand years. Did he ever mention or do you have an idea how long this, this place will last? Well, I'm hopeful 
that it will last that length of time. But the idea was to engineer every detail in order for it to last as long as possible. Yeah. It sounds like from other interviews I've read that he really let you call all the shots. And I was curious what some of your most favorite projects here have been in the renovations. Um, it's hard to rank the various <laughs> projects. But I'll tell you about the very first project, sure. which started me on more than 40 years of continuous construction here. When I bought the house, the glass in the living room was divided up by steel molds. It interfered with the view of the city which is one of the important features of this house. Yeah. So after putting up with that for about five or six years, I decided to consult with John Walker on converting the huge glass windows mm -hmm. of the living room into frameless blocks. And so I brought John Walker back. He hadn't seen the house since it was constructed. And not only was he shocked at some of the things that had been done, but he also wholeheartedly endorsed my idea of putting in frameless glass. So that became the starting point for all the improvements that I've made to this house, including the replacement of 100% of the glass in the house to frameless glass. That's a big, big job. <laughs> Glass is difficult to work with. It made a huge difference. Yeah. Because one of the important fundamental features of the house is that the inside and the outside are not visibly separated. It's beautiful. And I think John brought that continuous um, approach to a lot of his different works. That was important to both of us, and not only with that idea in mind did I replace the glass, but also I installed movable skylights okay. throughout the house so that the ceiling opens up as well. I think just a few days ago, you went to the Bob Hope house. Did they have any continuous openings? I don't um, recall electric openings like I had, but they had glass everywhere to bring in the, the view of the valley as well as the sky. So John, from what I remember, worked with Frank Lloyd Wright um, for maybe five or six years, I, th I think I've read. Frank Lloyd Wright was one of your favorite architects, is that correct? That's right. When did you notice Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture in your life and start to become <clears throat> interested? Well, I grew up in Milwaukee. Okay. And it so happened that one of my best friends in school lived a block away from me in a Frank Lloyd Wright house. So I was there on a weekly basis.
basis. Wow. And that by itself had a huge impact on me. But besides that house, my father owned a business in Racine, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. which was a few blocks away from the Johnson Wax plant. And I visited that plant numerous times and admired it so much. And then there was also a house in Racine designed by Frank Lloyd Wright that I visited. So in my teenage years, I was impacted in a major way by Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. Me, me too. <laughs> um, on my street in New Jersey, there's a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Uh -huh. And I moved there because of that. <laughs> and I, I, I've met the owner now. And uh, he's very generous in, in speaking to me about the, the renovations and um, you know how, how detailed you need to be to preserve the house, just like you've done here. Does, does John, from what you remember, did he have any funny stories about Frank Lloyd Wright that you recall? I don't recall any funny story, <laughs> but every time Frank Lloyd Wright's name came up, which it did quite often, yeah. it was always Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright. And um, I'm not sure how long he worked for Frank Lloyd, right? He said five years or so. I had, had the impression it was much longer. Oh, yeah. And he was uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's number one assistant on the Falling Water House, as well as many others. That's incredible. I'm sure that experience helped him to shape, you know, all the other works he's done around L.A. Well, I feel as though he took Frank Lloyd Wright's experience a step further because as time went on, there were technology innovations which allowed him to advance the Frank Lloyd Wright approach. Yeah, he, he kept it going. And I'm sure, just like it sounds like you've worked with some of the um, disciples or pupils of, of John to continue on the renovations that you've done. Is that true? Yes, I think that's a fair statement. So I'd love to talk about some of the, the new additions where you have really captured the same style, concrete, feel, different angles. That's really a, a new addition primarily for entertainment, is that correct? The new addition, which I named Club Jinx, is a combination of purposes. It's for entertainment, it includes a tennis court, which I've always wanted to have because I've been a tennis player since I was a young kid. It includes my offices, and uh, the next project that's slated to be added to it will be a theater. So it encompasses many different things. Wow. That's incredible. And um, I think many people probably know that you have donated this house and the land uh, to LACMA. And do you think that, that that addition will benefit them in the long term to host parties or talks 
to raise money and support the arts? I'm hoping they carry on the things that I have been doing here, yeah. which include uh, photo shoots, fashion shoots, films, music videos, parties, etc. And in discussions with the museum, they told people that was their intention. Excellent. I'm hoping that they intend to open the house up for architectural students for visiting architects from all over the world and I'm hoping that it will provide the awareness of good architecture to the world. Do you feel as though in addition to you know the, the donation and it being in good hands do you think entertainment and celebrity and Hollywood and music videos and the movies, do you think that helps preservation in general so people see and feel this important architecture? I'm not sure about preservation as much as I think it will inspire good architecture in the future. Mm -hmm. And I should point out that the word preservation doesn't apply to this house. Okay. Because preservation, the term preservation, implies that you, someone tries to bring a structure back to its original form. Okay. And in this case, the house was hampered in its original form by severe budgetary considerations. So it was never my intent to try to bring it back to its original form. It was my intent to take John Lochner's design to the utmost possibilities aside from any budgetary restrictions and to, uh, for example, replace plaster with concrete, replace glass, as I mentioned, that was split up with steel frames yeah. to replace it with frameworks, uh, to do all the necessary things to enhance the house yeah. as opposed to uh, bringing it back to its original. That makes a lot of sense and I think it's obvious um, that, that you have perfected it with John and with a number of his um, you know, pupils and disciples and the work and the time and the, the thinking. I always go back to so many decisions to make and, and you've made such incredible decisions to get the best of this, this property. It's unbelievable. I'm curious, so going to another one of your items on your business card in basketball, where architecture and basketball intersect is in arenas. Do you have any that you uh, really like from an architectural standpoint that you always like to go back to when you're traveling around the country? I think that um, certainly some arenas capture good architecture more than others. I can think of the basketball arena in Paris, for example, that is beautiful from the outside with grass lawns growing on the 
angular exterior, for wow. example. I think that um, the arena in Brooklyn mm -hmm. is, is a very nice one. And getting away from basketball and thinking about stadiums, yeah. uh, the stadium in Beijing that was built for the Olympics was amazing. Wow. And recently, the new football stadium in Los Angeles mm -hmm. is really fantastic. fantastic. And I'm very happy that uh, the owner of the Los Angeles Rams went all out with no budgetary constraints on the football stadium in Los Angeles. Yes. It has brought more fans, I'm sure, have hosted such incredible events there. That was a big investment. <laughs> And a big effort, I think, to get all the approvals needed over time, right? From what yeah. I've heard. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. In your travels for basketball or around the world, um, are there any other modernist architecture buildings or houses that you've gotten to visit and that you really enjoyed? Absolutely. Again, going back to Paris, which I visit frequently on a yearly basis, they've built some beautiful new buildings there. And wow. They really understand what it takes to make something right. Uh, I've made numerous trips to Dubai, mm -hmm. which to me is the ultimate place to see modern architecture. Wow. Because the creativity there is really unbelievable. They seem to have an open mindset there, which Americans don't have. And I think that many civic buildings that require the approval of the local administration suffers in the U.S. And I know that Lochner wanted to do civic projects, which he was never allowed to do because of the short-sighted mentality of the civic people. I feel like I read that he didn't have a great perception of LA in, as a city. Is, is that part of the reason well, why? <laughs> uh, if you want a funny story from Walker, sure. you, just, you just triggered one. <laughs> when Walker was celebrating his 80th birthday at a big event at the museum downtown. He was asked a question, what would you do to improve Los Angeles? And so his answer was, I would construct a huge concrete wall and take it up to Mulholland Drive and roll it down the mountain. <laughs> so that was his opinion of the overall architecture of Los Angeles. Wow. It seems like he was a, a character. And um, it's, really, it's really special you got to work with him for such a long period of time. Um, was, it, was it really collaborative to share ideas and, and try to accomplish this? The sequence of events in working with John in 
always started with one of my requests. I would say, for example, I want to replace the furniture in the living room with built-in furniture. And John would say, great. And it would only take a day or two before his assistant would bring me four different sketches of what to do with the sofa that I'm now sitting on. And I would look at the sketches and say, this one looks the best. So the next step would be to build a small scale model mm. based on the sketch. And we would look at the model together and I would suggest some new answers to modify it. And he would respond to those and so we would modify the model. And then we would make a full-scale model yeah. of and that would impact maybe the size of it, yeah. certain angles. In the full-scale model, we would Thank see yeah. more modifications to make. And then the actual construction would start and Sometimes during the actual construction, certain changes would be made. Yeah. So everything was a long process. I'm curious, knowing that you host a lot of events here in the club and in the pool, um, are there any other notable friends of yours that also have modernist architecture and are, are really passionate about it like you are? Well, you brought up the Bob Oak House. Sure. And Ron Burkle is the owner of that house now. And he's responsible for putting it into such amazing condition. Yeah. And he has attended events here, and I'm sure that I've had some influence on him. Another person is the famous clothing designer, Jeremy Scott. Mm. And Jeremy Scott bought two Lochner houses, wow. and I'm sure Jeremy has not only come here to see my house, but has actually hosted a big event here. Wow. And I'm sure that I've had an impact on Jeremy, who has done a great job in improving his houses. Talking about impact, I think it's clear through the entertainment, the filming you've done here and everything, uh, that you've, you've been a voice for modernist architecture. Um, do you view this house as, you know, uh, a, a child or part of your, your legacy? Absolutely. I think about what changes or future projects that I can make here every day. This house is a huge part of my mentality. Incredible. I think um, many people within our audience and myself are obsessive <laughs> about architecture. I love furniture as well. Uh, you know, cars from this time period. And I think it, it, it takes somebody who gets to that level of detail 
in everything to really appreciate what's been done here and look at the, the small angles, right, or the furniture spacing and understand that that was designed on purpose, right? I think that not enough people understand that everything around them is designed with, with purpose, right? So I was, I was curious, and certainly in fashion, I've heard you mention you've, you've designed, you know, certain different hats you have and had an input, had a voice in what was created. Do you consider yourself a, a designer at all? Yes, I do. Um, many people said to me, you've done such an amazing job here on this house. You should design for other people as well. But uh, I've never had any interest in doing that because I don't think other people would have the patience that I have, and they probably want to get rid of me <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> it would make them realize that they might have to wait about three years for some small piece of design to be realized. Absolutely. You, you, you have to wait. You have to be patient to get it right. And I think it's it's clear that you have you have really gotten it right here, and and certainly you know in the in the other areas that you're focused on as you know one of the biggest fans of the NBA, and I think one of the you know most most iconic people in, in fashion today. Um, and so I just want to thank you so much for for having me here, for taking the time, and now. Uh, now we can go on a, a little tour, if that's good with you. Great. I truly believe James Goldstein should be widely known as an accomplished multidisciplinary designer. It needs to be added to that business card of his. The depth at which he described his relationship, input, and process with one of the greatest modernist architects truly demonstrates his ability. It is his individual effort that has led to the ever-expanding masterpiece that is the Sheets Goldstein residence, which I hope lasts in the hands of LACMA for those 500 years, bringing joy and education to those who are able to visit. I want to share my sincere thanks to James, Roberta, David, and of course, my friend and podcast partner, Greg, who produce these gorgeous scenes and music. We continue to seek out what we believe will be some of the most interesting conversations we can have around mid-century modern design and appreciate all of the love and support you've shown us. Keep telling friends, sharing, and rating, and we'll all grow together in our knowledge from now until the next mid-century.